Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Not Quite Strangers. My name is Valerie Hope. I'm a leadership coach, a professional speaker, and I host this podcast. This pod podcast is an opportunity to bring two people together who have not met each other, have no clue about one another, just to show how easy it is to inspire curiosity, build connection, and disrupt the way in strangers interact. That's what I'm committed to. Today, I have wonderful guests, as usual. I always say that about my guests. All my guests are wonderful. Always bring something in unique and special to the conversation. I want to just start off by saying, and I met you, wow, when did we meet? Like, a, seven, like three months, four months ago? Like sometime, I don't know. It's been, oh. it, we haven't, yeah, in the fall sometime of 2021. And what was fascinating is, yeah, we were on a panel in Toastmasters where we had to share a little bit about our expertise and our, you know, our backgrounds. And I remember you sharing some of the things that you thought about in, re in relationship to psychology. And then also I heard some spirituality in there and I was like, oh, she's interesting. I need to know more about her. And we chatted a little bit offline, but then ultimately I was like, okay, you just need to be on my podcast. I think I'll get to know you even better, but then I need to find someone that would be of equal stature and power and, and interest. Hmm, who could that be? And enter my buddy, Al Dawson. Al, you and I have known each other for several years now. Um, we met at Unity, um, the Unity Church, and you have been my Reiki master healer <laughs> in the, in, since I've known you. And also we have just great conversations around, again, healing and spirituality. And I as soon as I saw you the last time, Al, I was like, I know who I'm going to introduce and to, and magic <laughs> happened. And then the stars aligned. So thank you both <laughs> so much. Thank you. Saying yes. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Well, good yes. to be here. Good. I, my first, first question is, why did you say yes to meeting a stranger in a public forum like a podcast? <laughs> Who does that? Why did you do this? <laughs> Let's start with you, Al. Okay. Well, it's really hard to say no to you, number one. <laughs> you have ways of, of, of weaving that web of drawing people in. But, you know, I thought about, you know, I've always just been curious about people in general. And, you know, my husband says that, you know, I never meet strangers and I go to the grocery store and I end up in conversations with people that I don't know. And I thought this would be a really nice uh, opportunity to to meet someone in a different you know, format to, you know, interact in a way that, you know, perhaps, you know, I haven't done before. And I just thought it would be fun. So I was all like right. all in. Yes, let's have fun. And, and I'm literally, I think a relative stranger when I invited you to do this. So why did you say yes? Well, I feel like I've known you a long time, Valerie, just what you had to say. I just felt we're kindred spirits. And um, as a retired psychiatrist, I tend to dive right in. So excuse me, as I dive and say, in my field, there are no strangers. Everybody could be a representation of something in your unconscious mind. <laughs> and with that in mind, <laughs> we meet people with interesting curiosity. Like, wow, what part of my unconscious might you be, Al? <laughs> What's <Interesting>. okay? <laughs> it gives you this great curiosity and question mark to everyone you meet that they have some nutrition for your soul. And exactly. you have something for them. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, the thing about it is that, you know, until you take that first step, you know, and open the door, you never know what's on the other side. So it, it, it seems like throughout my life, that's always been kind of a unifying theme that that's happened. You know, I worked as a psychotherapist for many years. I don't know if Valerie told you that or not, but I told nothing uh, about neither. Oh, of you, oh, neither. Oh, of you. Tell me about that, Al. <laughs> Well, you know, it was something that I always wanted to do, uh, and and it and it was born out of something that was really, I won't say silly, but I used to love the Bob Newhart show, 
when he, you know, was the uh, the psychologist and he would have people come in and I thought, you know, that's a really, really cool job. You know, I would love to be able to do that and to be able to help people and to connect with people on, you know, not only a level where you interact with them in a way that is, um, I guess, helpful or beneficial or supportive, but, you know, when, when, I worked as a psychotherapist, I always got something out of that. It was always, I always felt enriched by all the individuals, all the clients that I saw. So uh, yeah, that's, that's where that kind of came from. I agree. Really fun career. And I also love the Bob Newhart show. <laughs> and I had no clue that that would be a common thread, but uh, <laughs> alas, we have one. <laughs> All right. So, and I'm going to double click on something you said, because I want to hear more when you were talking about this, looking in your subconscious to see what it was that would attract you to talk to this person. So, A, <laughs> tell us more about what that means for people who may not be familiar with that concept. And then B, what did you pick up on? What, what, what maybe came to mind as you were exploring that question? Well, I am currently working on a talk, for example, about feeding the soul. And I call it the soul food diet and that we all know what to feed our physical bodies, or at least we may not follow it, but we, we basically know. But I find most people don't know what to feed their, their souls. And to me, everything we feed our physical bodies has a parallel in the psychological body. So I bring this up because I feel like every exchange can be an exchange of soul food. They have something that's going to feed my soul. I have something that's going to feed their soul. And to be looking for those things, suddenly a stranger, stranger <laughs> turns into, wow, this person has something for me. Obviously they're in my life. And what, what a gift. And to be looking for that something Mm -hmm. rather than just, um, I used to be very business oriented as far as we had a business exchange here, I'm buying this from you, here's the money, da, da, da. Yeah. And now it's more, and I learned this from a man I was dating. He was so engaging with everyone he met. And I thought, wow, he treats everyone like a real person. Wow. It's so good to be with you and get, tell me about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I would think I'm here to buy bananas. And <laughs> And he's, you know, giving out information and pamphlets and things that he's learning and, and uh, websites. And I was like, wow, <laughs> he is really giving himself to everyone he meets. And it really got me to change my ways that um, I was used to being intensely personal and giving in therapeutic encounters, but it became, no, 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 no. All of life is a therapeutic encounter. Mm. <laughs> so receive what this person's giving give them what you have for them. And it, it suddenly becomes an unforgettable experience. Oh, wow. that resonates Beautiful. so much with me. I got, yeah, I got some yeah, goosebumps on that one. I, you know, I, is, is this person related to me? <laughs> I feel so much of what you just described kind of runs my life, especially more. So now, as you mentioned that the older I've gotten, the more open I've been, I get more and more open. I've always had great experiences because we've traveled a lot as a family. I traveled a lot as my, on my own. And part of the experience of travel also trained me to just, Hey, I never know what I'm going to get anywhere I go and what friendships I'll build or what activities I'll get connected to unless I'm open, unless I'm curious, unless I just, you know, listen. So part of it was some of that conditioning. And then then it started becoming really fun <laughs> to try to figure out, ooh, <laughs> what can I learn from this person? Or what will I learn about myself through this interaction? That's been a really fun thing too, just to experience. I mean, I, I talk to people on the plane. You know, I'm, the, I'm that person. I shouldn't say I'm that person. <laughs> I, I can be that person that gets in a really engaging conversation if I feel that there's some interest, right? I respect people's privacy, but I, I remember sitting next to this woman on the plane a while back and when I, I sat in the middle seat, you know, the middle seat cannot be <laughs> that's not always the most comfortable. And I, somehow I rubbed up against her and she just recoiled and was kind of cur curled up against the window. And at first I was just like, okay, that was rude. 
because <laughs> she did it with such a like oh, you know bother and i'm like yeah. what is that um and then so throughout the flight i just started getting curious about what was going on with her because she literally just stayed curled up until at one point she had to run go to the restroom and on her way back i noticed she sniffled a couple of times and then she wiped her cheek and i'm like oh she's crying wow. so i asked hey are you okay and and i just kind of touched her gently gently on the shoulder and she nodded and said, yes, yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Um, I'm like, all right, you just, I thought you were crying. And she's like, I just buried my mom yesterday. Oh, wow. Oof. And from that, we had such a beautiful conversation. She shared all this stuff about her experience, burying her mother, her siblings, and what she was experiencing that moment. And we talked the rest of the flight for, for at least an hour or so. By the end of the flight, we hugged on the way out and the way out. But I thought, wow, what a missed opportunity had I just had that story in my head about how rude or how inconsiderate or whatever I made up about her. Uh, so I'm so grateful for my training and also, you know, the, the grace <laughs> that kind of landed on me in the moment to just inquire what's going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. And that the universe conspired to place you there at that time, you know, and allowed you to be able and be open enough to to start that conversation, you know. So what a gift that was to both of you yeah. to be able to experience that. That's it's amazing when I think about, you know, the things that happen in life that, you know, sometimes we could just gloss over it when there is this divinity that is a part of that, that mm -hmm. aligns things if we allow it to. Mm. And what are your thoughts on this? Well, I was just thinking about a friend I had once who traveled as her spiritual path. And I asked her, well, how, how does that work? <laughs> and she said, well, I usually go off with a thousand dollars and and I just travel all over. Like the last I heard, she spent a year in the East. She was a Vietnamese woman. And so she went back to Vietnam with a thousand dollars. And she said, when I run out of money, I get a job. Um, when it gets cold, I go south. When it gets warm, I go north. <laughs> and she does a lot of praying about where she's supposed to go. And um, a single woman. And she being Vietnamese, she was quite petite. And I was just in awe of her faith that $1,000 is not a lot of money these days. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, how she, she said, well, it's like anything else. You pray about where to go and where, who you're supposed to meet. And she said she ran into a couple of people that didn't seem honorable, but most people were. And um, she said she just obviously trusts God to guide her. And that was her spiritual journey. And I just thought that was amazing. I've never met anyone who traveled for their yeah. spiritual path. You know, most of us go to a church or synagogue or read books or whatever. And, and she did it through traveling and allowing her spirit to guide her. That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that would I, be such. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, Al, you're my guest. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say that would be such an amazing book to read. You know, of the stories and the interactions that she's been witness to and a part of. You know, and just what that would do to shift people's preconceptions about strangers and being in a quote-unquote strange land. Uh, oh my God, that would be just incredible. And do you know her? Tisha's uh, trust, because literally yes. everything's foreign, everything is new, and to really trust. And she said that that's the whole point to really get these skills down. So when she comes back to where she lives, she can keep the practice going of mm -hmm. trusting that moment by moment guidance. Fascinating. Do you are you still in contact with her? I'm not. You're not. Hmm. I hear, I, I see podcast I, <laughs> wheels turning. Was that evident? Was that obvious? Like, I'm like, mm, that would be someone interesting to chat with as well. Wow. Yeah. I, I can try to track her down for you, Valerie. I would love that if you can, that would be fantastic. I, but I'm open. again, this, I, this, uh, podcast path, I guess you could call it is a little bit like that for me too. I don't have preconceived notion about necessarily who I want and what I want to talk about. I just kind of see what comes to the surface. And when I meet someone, I generally know, okay, that might be a good, interesting conversation or interesting perspective. Who can I match with that person? 
and and it's and it's worked every time in the last 48 episodes so i'm really grateful for this opportunity and the fact that a lot of people have said yes i'm down let's do it um you know, i want to shift a little bit here and ask each of you brought some questions and i don't know who would like to go first but i would love for you to ask one of the questions that you have all right uh, if you don't mind al no, what, go ahead. what comes to mind is when we talk about travel, that's one of my favorite questions to ask everyone I meet because it's pretty innocuous, right? Yeah, tell me a travel story. But people say a lot about themselves by their travel <laughs> story. So retired psychiatrist that I am, I can't help but notice what people say in their stories. So with that in mind, Al, would you like to share a travel story? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, this is a story that um, I always go to and I always think about it because it's such a wonderful memory for me. Um, I used to work uh, for the uh, medical school here, UT Southwestern Medical Center. And uh, I was part of the Dallas Prevention Training Center and we were funded through the CDC to provide HIV uh, prevention trainings across the United States. We had 13 states in the, uh, the southern portion of the uh, United States. As a part of that, I got a chance to work as a team that went to Africa to do this comprehensive uh, HIV prevention training. Wow. And so uh, we went to Nairobi and I spent a week in Nairobi uh, training individuals there uh, with this particular strategy. And after we trained them, we went to another town named Kasumu, which is right on Lake Victoria, I believe. And so we spent that week, we had trained the individuals to actually present this training to build the capacity within the country itself. And so uh, myself and another trainer from Colorado, who's one of my best friends. Um, and so uh, she calls me her African husband and I call her my African wife because everybody thought we were married when we were there. <laughs> and so uh, we went through the second week, the, uh, the individuals that we trained, they uh, did the training at Kasumu. And so that Friday evening, they wanted to take us out because we were going to leave the next day. So we, we go out to this club uh, in the square, and it's called the Quorum. And so we went there, and Katie and I bought them a round of drinks, and then they bought us a round of drinks, and then people just walked up off the street because they knew people that were there, and they bought rounds of drinks. And so that went on for a while. And I spoke to one of our guys and I said, you know, we really got to get something to eat because we've been here for an hour or two and we've been drinking Tusker, with, uh, I think it's Tusker, which is like the, the beer of, the, of, of, uh, of Kenya, the, the, the national beer of Kenya and uh, sweet red wine, as they like to call it. And so they said, oh, we'll take you to this place called the Railhead. And so we piled into the back of this truck and mind you, I'm in Kasumu. I don't know many of these people. Uh, we pile into this truck, we drive off into the night, and there is this cinder block building out in the middle of nowhere. And there is a railhead that's behind it. And they have all these trees and they have these plastic chairs out and there's this band playing. Um, music of the country. And so we go in and they have this thing called uh, village chicken. And so they take us and we have to choose the chickens that we're going to eat. So we go and choose the chickens and they prepare this meal for us. We eat it. Uh, we're out dancing, enjoying the music. It's a full moon out. And it's just one of the most, I mean, I, I think as I, grow older and I sit and I remember the things of my life, this will always be one of the, the most incredible uh, moments. I'm halfway across the world mm -hmm. and yet I'm connected with these people that I feel so you know, close to. I mean, we've been together for like two weeks and it was so funny because 
they would argue over what tribe I was a part of because they say, <laughs> no, Al is a part of this tribe and he's this, you know, and then they would say, no, no, he's a part of this tribe. And it's funny because I did a DNA uh, test and a significant part of my DNA is from Kenya. And oh. it was amazing because it was the place that I felt so connected to. I mean, I've been to Botswana yeah. and I've been to South Africa and I've been to several places there, but the people there, I just felt at home. And so uh, that that's my travel story. Um, it's absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. What a beautiful image, what the world can be like with everyone coming together. Yeah. Just gorgeous. Yeah. All right. So, Anne, you kind of set this up for yourself. So um, now that you've heard Al's story, what what stood out to you? What does it tell you about him? Well, just a heart for the people and a heart for community and just possibilities of what can be. Hmm. Now, it's just kind of what we've been talking about with everybody bringing something to the table and mm -hmm. everyone partaking in it, everyone equal. Um, it's just such a beautiful image of what mm. we like. That's awesome. You want to tell us the travel story, Anne? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of my favorite stories is I had read through a travel book that there was a, it was called Arnal Volcano Lodge in Costa Rica. And according to this booklet, the tourists will eject from their beds as they hear the rumbling of the volcano because they have picture windows that look out over the volcano and it's an active mm -hmm. volcano. And I thought, I love adventure. That sounds adventurous. So <laughs> I purchased tickets with, for myself and my ex-husband and I was just leaving the tourist agency when they said, oh, by the way, do you, do you have a four wheel drive car? And I said, no, I'm just a rental car. Oh. Uh, is that going to be a problem? She said, well, probably not. I mean, it isn't the rainy season. So you, you go ahead. I'm sure it'll be no problem. Uh, what, what, wait, wait, wait. What, what's the problem here? She said, well, you have to cross two rivers to get to the Arnold Volcano Lodge. Two rivers, not creeks. No, they're, they're rivers, but they're, like I said, not the rainy season. You go along. I'm sure you'll be fine. Well, come to find out that no problem is kind of the theme song of the, of the um, Costa Rican culture. So because the roads are so bad, it took us all day. I mean, we were driving like 10 miles an hour with big boulders in their roads. It was ridiculous to get to this place. And we were just turning off the main road when all these cars were coming in the opposite direction, speaking the international language of don't go there. <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, okay, we drove all day. You know, my, my ex husband was just so, we're going. We drove all day, we're going. It's like, okay. <laughs> so we come to the first river, and all these cars are looking out of the people out of the car. They're looking at the river, going, I don't think so, honey. Didn't know. I really don't. <laughs> and Claude, my ex husband, said, We're going. So we went through the the river and the rent -a car did have water for in, into the, they were like rivers. Yes, they were. Oh, so we got to the other side and the families were like, uh, uh, do you want to? No, no, no. <laughs> and then we went through the second river and got stuck in the middle. Oh. So there were big boulders in the second river. So fortunately, all the families rolled up their pant legs, went in, took the boulders away. They weren't that big. And uh, I, I probably should say large stones. And, um, and then we were on the other side and we got the, mm. what we needed, we, the help to get off to the other side. They got what they needed. They weren't about to get the rent a car wet. So they mm -hmm. left and we were on our way. <laughs> so we go to this volcano lodge and sure enough, gorgeous picture window looking out over the Ooh. volcano. It was spectacular. And sure enough, within a few minutes of arriving, we hear this. <laughs> and Clive, my ex-husband says, you know, I, I think the plumbing's not good here. When it was the volcano, the volcano oh, was moaning. Oh, gosh. Just wow. Just tremble and moan and, you, you know, you'd be feeling it. And um, that night at dinner, they had just a bunch of scientific types and hippie types. And it was just loads of fun, great food, great conversation on all different, really amazing topics. 
And um, one young group of men were talking about hiking a volcano that morning and they were like, they, they were good. And it, it started moaning and shaking and they were running in the opposite direction just in case it was going off. And I just thought that was so funny. These big guys were so scared. Of the but we went the next day and the same thing happened. We were hiking the volcano and it starts we go running scared we, <laughs> we had such a good time that we stayed another night and it was like two or three in the morning we heard the moan we looked out the picture window and it was pouring lava it oh, was wow. absolutely spectacular so wow. unforgettable loved it wow <laughs> and no one was hurt Oh gosh. And you Very were able cool. to cross the river on the way back. <laughs> oh, oh, that's the other story. Yeah. Oh. They said, uh, we're a little worried about getting out of here. No problem. They said, no problem. They showed us how to do it theoretically. And um, by driving in front of us, you take a right here and then some sharp left and da, 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 da. Well, we got stuck in the boulders again and the water poured in and it dried over the weekend, but the water starts pouring in again. And um, but they helped us move the boulders or whatever, and we were on our way. So the big thing was, what are we going to do about the rent car? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we took care of it as best as we could, as if it were our own. It really looked pretty good when we returned it, and the man looked it over quite thoroughly, and he said, you're good to go. <laughs> so prayer, nothing like it. Better than <laughs> a cat litter or everything else you might use for a flooded car. Somehow I'm 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 almost certain that's not the first time he's seen a flooded car. <laughs> mm. It's good enough. It's good enough. Oh wow! All right, so I'm going to ask Al the question I asked you, Anne. So Al, what do you get out of her of her story? Well, number one, a an incredible sense of adventure. Um, the other thing I get out of it is even in the face of difficulty and obstacles, there's always this sense of humor. There's a way of reframing those situations in a way that takes perhaps the sting out of them. Um, and also there's a, an, an element or a, a part of awe that I think runs through all of that, you know, that, you know, the desire to see this, this, this part in this element of nature that is unbridled and untamed, but to step up to that and to view it and witness that, I think says something about um, definitely who you are as an individual, you know, that, you know, doesn't shy away from the unexpected or, mm. you know, things that uh, might not necessarily go as according to plan. Okay. Well, very good. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, it's funny, as I heard both of you share your stories, I think what comes up to is this idea of courage is one way to put it, but, but really to be open enough to be contributed to. You know, both of you in your story shared how others guided your experience. You trusted that the fact that they were you know, taking you to a place that was going to be safe or interesting or fun. The fact that you could get through whatever you were going to face and, and do so with, you know, and be and be safe and not, you know, not be injured or, or worse. And so it's interesting, I think, to hear how much trust you have in people and faith you have in humanity to support whatever goals you, you have. That's what I got from it. Beautiful. So kudos. And I found myself thinking, I'm like, oh, what, what travel story would I say? I have, I have several. Um, the one that popped, I have a couple that popped into my mind, but the one that I thought would be interesting is um, <laughs> I traveled to Poland once. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in an organization, we traveled all over Europe uh, called Up With People. And, mm. and we stayed with host families often, but there's one particular time we were in Germany and there was a group of students who wanted to take a, a study trip for a week to Poland. And I, I was a staff member and I volunteered to go as a chaperone, part of, partly because their study entailed 
going to uh, the Jewish ghetto in Krakow and also Auschwitz. And there's something about that time in history and that particular focus that really intrigues me. And I've been to I've been to Auschwitz, I've been to Dachau, I went to Hiroshima when I was in Japan. There's something about that era of history. We lived in Hawaii, went to Pearl Harbor. So there's all this I was kind of curious about. So we go to Poland, we stay in a, in a youth hostel. And the day we were supposed to go to Auschwitz, it was already, you know, we were, we had our reservations about it. We knew it was going to be kind of a, a heavy, difficult thing. And, and we thought, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were mentally and, and emotionally mm-hmm. rested. So we leave our youth hostel. We get on a bus that takes us to the, to the, the main, we had to take another bus from, from the city to go to Auschwitz. So on the public bus, on the city bus though, it was crammed. It was like rush hour, all sorts of people. I'm the chaperone. I'm in my twenties, right? <laughs> the chaperone, and and the other the other ladies in the in the group, in the study group, were also in early twenties too. I was a little older than they, but we were all kind of split up when we got on the bus because there was so it was so crowded. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, one of the the young ladies mentioned. Hey, get out, get out of, somebody's in my backpack. She had a backpack on and apparently somebody had put their hand in it. And so I tried to make my way there. A couple of us got to her and she her bag was somehow was unzipped. And I said, what happened? She said, so, some guy or someone had their, their hand in my backpack. And about that time, the bus stopped and we saw a couple of guys jump off the bus. And we were looking and looking and, and I was like, is it the, that guy or those two? And she's like, yeah, yeah, it was one of those two. Um, both of them had bald heads wearing a denim jacket. And while we were there at the stop, we noticed that I was watching them because my dad always said, pay attention to where you're going, pay attention to what people are doing. So I was watching them and I saw that they went from one side of the bus stop, the outside little kiosk to the opposite side. And they took their jackets off and they put their jackets over their arm. And one of them, we were in the back of the bus. One of them got back on the same bus, but this time towards the front. And I remember just staring him down because I'm like, oh, I know what you did. Don't mess with my people. <laughs> and I guess my energy was really bright because he made eye contact with me and he went like this. I freeze out. Like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He saw me. I'm the only black person in the city. <laughs> and I'm like, really I'll be hard easy to find. To no. Yeah, really hard to miss. And I'm like, are we gonna get killed? What's going on? And so l- luckily that that was fine. Um, we we got off the bus, we ended up going to the next bus, but the, the, it did leave kind of cast a bit of a pall <laughs> on our experience. So we left the city a few days later, we went to crack, uh, we were going to Warsaw and we had to take the train. We had reservations on the train. We were running a little late. So we were the last ones to get on the train. The train was still at this platform. And you know we were all in the single file kind of rushing to get on the train at our particular uh, train, uh, what do you call it? Um, a cabin, mm-hmm. whatever you, yeah, the car, the, the specific okay. car. I was the last one, you know, bringing up the rear as the other girls were coming. We had suitcases and backpacks and whatever. And I saw these two gentlemen, there was no one else in the platform. I saw these gentlemen, nothing like the ones that we saw a few days before, but they were walking back towards the main station from the train, from the front of the train to the main station. And as they were walking, I don't know why, but I just kind of noticed and I kept walking. All right, we got to go. We got to run. And one of them continued to walk. The other one slowly turned around and started walking back towards the front. And I was just like, why is he walking towards the front? Everyone's gone. That's weird. And then next thing I saw, he took off his jacket and he put it over his arm. And I was like, I've seen that before. (laughs) Okay. All of a sudden, like spidey Mm -hmm. senses are up. So we get closer to the car. A couple of the students were like, hey, we're just going to jump on any car because we don't want this train to start moving. And we're walking ourselves inside the train. And we were like, all right. So a few of us continued. By this point, the gentleman started to kind of come towards the train where we were. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. He wasn't doing anything. He didn't look at us. He looked like he had something to do. But I'm like, why would he leave and then turn around? What's happening? Mm -hmm. So two of the girls jumped on. He came between me and and the two that went on the train. And when I finally got on the train, he had one hand, there was a full uh, a door that went back and forth like this to get into the train and car. He had one hand here 
my 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 student was in front of him trying to push to get the door in there was another guy on the other side pushing the door to come out so she was essentially trapped when i was just like oh my gosh get off come on jamie get off the get off the train get off the train i'm like i don't know what's going on i don't know if he has a gun or a knife or what and so she was like get that off my <laughs> so eventually we jumped off luckily he came to the window and he was just looking down at us and we ran towards the front of the train as far as we could before we thought okay the train's going to take off without us we jumped back on and then we just looked for a couple of ladies that <laughs> looked safe <laughs> enough to sit with but i was like oh my gosh that trip was it was already tense because we were traveling but then with these two experiences but at the wow. same time i kept thinking to myself like you know i used to think my dad was kind of paranoid <laughs> and a little over the top but he did train me to just keep an eye around my environment and see what was happening because we didn't speak the language. We had no clue what was going on. We had no Polish speaker with us. Um, so anyway, but that experience really marked. And I thought, OK, that's probably like the most dangerous thing that I experienced in my travel. Um, but I feel really confident that, OK, I was able to get through it. And all, and all the girls were safe. Everybody was fine. <sighs> so Wow. Poland. Sorry. You should go visit. That was harrowing. <laughs> wow. I think I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also curious, what, what does that say about me? What, what does that story, story tell you, if anything? Well, you have wonderful leadership qualities okay. and you are observant and sensitive in many areas and you're so brave, courageous, staring these people down. <laughs> um, or down. Wow, I thought you were awesome. You go, girl. Thank you. Interesting. I love that. Uh, that might be one of the activities for people who are listening or watching to find someone and ask them, tell me a travel story. Yeah. Anything I actually once asked uh, a man for a travel story trying to, you know, stranger, trying to start conversation. And he told me about going to the Sahara camping trip and it rained. Do you know how often it rained? How often does that happen? It was like every 56 years or something like that. And he happened to pick the, the day. And he said, the travel guide was like, get your tents on top of the dunes. It, you, you might flood, you might drown, you might, because the water's so dry, it's not absorbed. So everything right. watches away. And he said, um, you know, the Americans, it took him a while to get them to feel the excitement of the moment and to get their tent up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a great Well, like, it's just rain. You're like, uh, <laughs> right. Not oh, here. It's about here. It. <laughs> and that's what I love about travel, just the differences of all the different communities, the different oh, foods, yeah. the different languages. Like I was in Tunisia, my ex-husband was a jazz musician. And I just uh -oh. loved how laid back the culture was and very, just everything was different. Everything, uh, there was like fluidity. It made me realize how our culture is much more rigid. Mm -hmm. And for example, in their culture, it's kind of shameful to say you don't know something. Mm -hmm. So I was asking what time the bus leaves, for example, from the, one particular city. And one person said, um, you know, 8.45 and another 9.30 and another 10.15. And, and then there was a 12.30 and, and none of them matched. And so I was like, what do you do with this? You know, which one is right? <laughs> and so we ended up taking one of these uh, taxis for the public uh, to our next destination. And the driver said, um, why didn't you take the bus? It's so much cheaper. And I said, well, I did go to the bus station, but I couldn't get a straight answer from anyone. What time does it leave? And he said, well, it's 6.30. No one had told me 6.30. They told me all these other times. <laughs> How do you know <laughs> in a culture like that? I guess you have to get used to it or find your own way. But that's one of my great ways of getting information. I love to talk to people mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. the news or whatever official source is talk to people. Mm -hmm. get yeah. Their impressions of what's going on. Al, you had a, a question that I cut you off. For. So as part of our little warm up, you had a question for her. And I don't know if it was it was in regards oh, to Tunisia or something, but actually it was. OK, actually it was. So the question I had 
is the the tapestry that you have behind you, Anne. I think you mentioned earlier that you obtained it in Tunisia, and it has a lot of symbolism in it that you've kind of mm -hmm. talked about before. And I guess maybe for the individuals who might be listening to the podcast, you can kind of give us some, I you know, uh, kind of a brief overview of that. But I'm curious as to what drew you to it because it's so very unique. Um, the color palette of it is, is interesting as well. So uh, I was just curious to know the backstory on it. Well, it all starts with my ex-husband asking me if I wanted to buy a, a rug in Tunisia because it's known for their rugs. He said, if you fall in love with the rug, you let me know and I'll buy it for you. And I thought, oh, that's so sweet. But falling in love with a, a rug, <laughs> you know, concept hadn't entered my head before. But sure enough, you get off the plane and instantly everyone's asking you, would you like to see my rugs? I'll sell you a rug. Yeah. It was just constant. Mm. And I saw this in a store and I fell in love with it. <laughs> I just had to have it because it is the stages of human development. And every section has something to say about the human journey, like the camels, for example, when we follow our animal instincts. And the fish, when we find the fluidity of the world around us and how this world comes from our minds making and we can change it so much by just changing our thought. And ultimately the man in the middle is the completed man. It's called the call man, uh, which is someone who's embraced their wholeness, all that they are, all that they've been, they embrace it and they find a way to share it with the world. Mm. So, so I love this rug. So I'm curious, was it love at first sight? <laughs> it, it was, it was. And it, we actually ended up buying three rugs while we were there. One for my ex-husband, one for me, and one for a friend who said, oh, if you see a nice rug, will you bring it back for me? <laughs> so we had three rugs. Didn't even think about it till we got to the um, baggage claim at the airport and there was a weight limit for each bag. <laughs> okay. We ended up wearing just about everything, all the clothes we brought, if you can imagine, <laughs> wearing everything. We had uh, socks in our pockets. It, it was just ridiculous. So we could put the rugs in the um, baggage. And unfortunately, we got there early. We were able to arrange all this. And when they weighed our bags, it was exactly the wow. weight limit. And the men are like, <laughs> Oh, isn't this strange? Each bag is exactly the maximum. Very strange. Like, yeah, no bigger. So we walked onto the plane. And we got a rug home. Unfortunately, then you had to buy two seats because you had all the clothes. <laughs> right. You're expanding beyond you know, the arms of the chair. But the thing that's so interesting about this to me, Anne, is that as you say, it was love at first sight. And I think about what it is that you do and that thread that connects, you know, the, 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 the foundation of how you interact with people being the foundation of this rug that you fell in love with, sight, I mean, at, at first sight. Mm. Mm. Coincidence? I, I think not. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to shift a bit here because both of you have alluded to the interest that you have in, in in psychology and the work that you've done before. Both of you also you I don't know if you've mentioned it yet. And since we've been speaking on the podcast, but you, I know you both have mentioned it to me and actually have had some personal experiences around healing that the two of you are also really uh, committed to supporting people and healing them and supporting their journey. So I'm curious about what what prompted that for you or what are the ways in which you find that people need to be healed that you want to contribute to? Well, I wow. was <laughs> wow. <medical school. laughs> um, I, I started hearing people's souls tell me why they were sick. And there was always a very good reason. I used to go home and cry and just praying, Lord, why, why are these people suffering so much? Mm. And it's just like my ears started opening up and I started hearing why. Like, for example, there was one very handsome young man who had it all going for him, just so successful in every area. And he was dying. And I was there. 
And um, his mom was holding him and saying, I never could let go of you, could I? And I realized, oh my goodness, she is, you know, just like flashing. She's a very controlling woman. And this is his way of getting away from her. And I just thought, oh my goodness, if she knew, if she just knew. And, and so that's, I call myself the soul listener because so many things people don't know. And if they just knew, they could make other choices for their lives. So wow. I've come to discover that every illness we have, every symptom, every disease process is a soul communication, trying to guess, get us to do a little more of this, and a little less of that. And to get us what we're here to do, to fulfilling our life's purpose. Okay, I was not expecting that. <laughs> Would you consider that then to be like a medical intuitive? Um, not really. And that usually med medical intuitives can say, oh, I see you have a problem here in your abdomen and it's this and that and take this. It's more, I hear Mm -hmm. I just talk to someone and what they're saying, like some words might stick out yeah. like um, this sore shoulder. <laughs> I'll hear sore <laughs> really loud. And sore also means anger. Mm -hmm. So, so when someone's mm -hmm. a sore shoulder, they're putting some anger there. And also what are they shouldering in life that they're angry about? Mm -hmm. And you just mm -hmm. kind of follow the, the trail. And I find when we listen to people really intently, they are telling us their stories, but we've been trained to put it into a diagnostic category. Mm. Not that I don't wanna in any way say there's something wrong with that. Cause you know, to me, we treat body and soul, but, but don't forget the soul. <laughs> so often we treat body and we don't get around to, but why is this in our lives? There's mm. always some really good reason. And then it goes from, oh gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that, to, oh wow, what an opportunity to hear what your soul is saying and make some changes. So it's an exciting thing. It's an adventure. It's a trip. It's a trip. You know, that's so interesting. And Al, you're, you and I have connected because one of the other things that you're so gifted at, you do, you perform Reiki, right? And I've gone to a couple of interactions, interventions with you. Um, and that it seems to me, at least what Anne is sharing, seems like you share some of those similar, perhaps, or connected ability to hear and see and be a channel. So can you share more about what you do? First of all, for people who don't know what Reiki is, maybe tell us a little bit about that. And then also what drew you to that? Or how do you, yeah, how do you develop that ability? You know, it's so, so Reiki is a, a form of energy healing. And it's, you know, viewing the body not only as the physical body, but the energetic systems that may make up the body as well. And I guess I was drawn to it. I was drawn to several things at one time. Um, I come from a background of the Southern Baptist background. And so I started to see and hear things that prompted me to look at my upbringing and my spiritual and religious upbringing in a different way. And as I started to open to that more, more things started to come. So uh, the first thing that I started to experience was um, I was drawn, well, let me take a step back. I became a part of this book club and it was called, I think it was called One Spirit Book Club. Uh, that was back in like the late 90s or uh, early 2000s. And when you joined this book club, you could order four books. And one of the books that I ordered was uh, a book called Shaman, Healer, Sage by Alberto Violdo. And so I started to read this and it's all about his uh, interactions with shamans in the, uh, the Amazon. And um, he talked about learning to see the energetic systems of the body. And as he described it in the book, it just made sense to me. I couldn't say that I had done that before, but it just resonated so strongly with me that I felt like, yeah, who, I mean, how, how, could you, how could you deny any of this? Or how could you say that this is not a part of who we are? We look at ourselves as these, you know, physical bodies. And, you know, sometimes we touch 
on the the spirit or the soul, you know, from a religious uh, aspect. But what I read allowed me to look at it from a very different perspective. Hmm. I also read at that time conversations with God, which really kind of reset, you know, the way that I kind of conceived of things. Um, and um, I was introduced to Reiki at that time as well. So all of these things kind of converged uh, into one uh, kind of shift for me. And from there, things just started to happen. I was a, I was a bookstore I used to go to all the time. And um, I happened to be in there one day and this book actually fell off the shelf. So, and I picked it up. And the book was The Reluctant Shaman. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, this is interesting because I had read the, the book before. And so I read it. And again, it, it just made sense to me. It, it kind of brought into perspective this, this realm of, of spirit that we don't always tap into. And so anything that I could do at that point in time to kind of draw in you know, more understanding, more learning, uh, more experience of that, you know, I try to, you know, I try to do. And so now as I do Reiki, uh, it's kind of a blend of Reiki and some of the things that I've, I've learned, you know, through shamanic practice and some of the trainings and uh, seminars that I've, uh, that I've attended. And so similar to how you kind of described it, and I don't, I don't hear what's, you know, the, the, the imbalance, uh, I feel it. And so when I'm working with someone, the energy feels different from one person to another. It's, it's almost like a fingerprint. And I can feel where there is an imbalance. And with Reiki, uh, it's not a directed kind of healing. It's uh, the type of, you are a channel for that energy and the energy is divinely guided, so it, it knows where to go. However, I, when I notice something that's awry, I'll use that term, I spend a little bit more attention there. And what I've learned to do now is to be more intuitive with it because things will pop up in my, in my head. You know, I'll get messages or things. And I used to think, well, you know, that's just, you know, my subconscious saying this or whatever, but, you know, from a shamanic standpoint, everything that comes is a part of the message. It's a part of the story. It's a part of the interaction. And so what I've learned to do now is to, to follow that and to go where it is. So if I get that, you know, you need to place your hands here, then that's where I place my hands. Or if you need to attend to the energy in this particular place, then I attend to the energy in that particular place. So it's been interesting and it's still evolving. You know, I sometimes vacillate between um, is what I'm doing truly helping? Is it assisting? Um, and whether or not it's I'm thinking of, I'm trying to think of the right word. Whether or not I'm truly assisting. Um, and you know, when I take a step back and I look at it, whenever we pay attention to someone, whenever we attend to someone, whenever we place our focus in a loving fashion, it's helping and it's assisting. And so, you know, those times when I question don't come as much as they used to. I, I, I like to try to blame it on that, that, that Southern Baptist, you know, fire and brimstone that, that, I, that I was brought up with. But um, it, it, it truly is a wonderful experience. And I, and I, and I enjoy that opportunity to interact with people in that way and to um, attend to. That's the only word I can think of that, that describes it, attend to and, and care for individuals in that way, so. Wow. I, I really enjoyed, I think the, 
I had one like session just to myself with you, Reiki session. And then other times when you were partnering with a sound bath experience and you went from mm -hmm. person to person. Okay. Yeah, but I just, I remember seeing colors and I remember this deep relaxation and it, it was, it was a lot of, of sensory. It was a really a, a nice sensory experience to have Reiki done. Um, and to just be able to be in the moment, I actually recently went to this place called the float spot. Have you guys heard of the float spot? You both are here yes. in Dallas. Yes. Have you gone? I, oh, I go there. All, are you, do you go to the one in Frisco? Yeah. 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 I know the guy that uh, Ray Toma is the owner of that. And when he opened, I had done uh, way back when uh, the movie uh, Alter States came out. There's a movie with William Hurt and they uh -huh. do. And part of that movie is uh, sensory deprivation. Mm. And they used to have a place here in Dallas. And I swear it was like a box that had been painted black and it was filled with salt water. And you just and you laid in it. But yeah, the uh, the flow spot is amazing. Yes. It is absolutely amazing. All right. And I saw you write it down. So, yes, you got to check it out. It's essentially sensory deprivation. My, I was, it was gifted to me for my birthday and I went and, you know, I, I meditate. So being still and being in silence is something that I've had a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. And this particular experience, you go into this capsule, for lack of a better word, that is like a big egg. Yeah, it looks like a big, a huge egg. <laughs> and uh, it's for one is one person and you go in and it's filled with with Epsom salt, you know, water and Epsom salts, basically so that the water actually has, has you float. So you float to the, to the top. And when you close the lid of this egg, it's completely dark and they can pipe in music you know, or sounds mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, but I did, um, I did spend half an hour in complete silence and darkness. And what I got from the experience was it felt, you know, and you mentioned the soul body, right? And, and, and Al, you mentioned the energetic body. I, I got in that moment that this physical body was actually not mine. None of that makes any sense because it was floating. I had no, I had, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. I was just there, this body, this physical body was just there. And, and I was borrowing it. It, it I don't know how else to explain it. Maybe you guys could yeah. find a better way to articulate it, but it felt like, you know, that weightlessness, that that sense of timelessness, that sense of there's no 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 sensory input, made my body actually kind of useless. <laughs> Does that resonate? No. I don't know. What do you guys no. think? No, it 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 almost the experience to me is like the body fades away and yeah. you're just consciousness. Yes, because the water is at the same temperature as your body, so mm -hmm. you don't always get the sensation that you're floating in water yeah. and so everything just kind of falls away and like you said it's in you're in complete darkness yeah so it it's an incredible experience incredible i yeah. I, I love going Oof. Wow. and what do you what do you think or what are you getting from that if anything or your reactions to that <laughs> Um, did you do it? Scared. Scared? <laughs> yeah. What makes you scared, do you think? Um, uh, just the lack of, uh, well, when I was in Tunisia, the, the lack of structure, mm. I just felt myself um, needing something to hold on to. It, mm. it just felt very fluid. So I was just imagining myself, because I can have a very vivid imagination, and what you were describing, Valerie, and I was uh-oh. <laughs> Needing some structure. Well, a couple of things. Well, a couple of things. So you can leave the lid open if you mm -hmm. like, so you don't have to close it. And it also oh. had, they also have lights inside that you can Ambient leave on lighting. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I recommend it. If you, since you're into soul, you know, and, and experiencing it, you might, I don't know, it might open up something new for you. Yeah. I, I so appreciate the three, the, the three of us having a very un distinct experience about this same instrument, you know, yeah. your yeah. soul and you're talking about the, the energy and then this, the, the, the non-physicality, um, how you, and one thing I thought, 
and I know we're gonna have to wrap up soon. I'm like, I could talk to you guys forever. By the way, I want to experience whatever it is that you share in, in your healing. So I think that's amazing. But both of you, I think very strongly, you mentioned this idea of you found or you followed what resonated for you. Both of you found your path or you're, you're on your journey. You are basically identifying what has resonance and you follow that. And, and I find that fascinating because I do think that life oftentimes allows us opportunities if and when we're con you know, conscious of what has resonance. And you know, I had an experience recently where something, some healing modality you could say is offered. It was a virtual experience that I had no resonance with. Like, it was just hard. Like, I don't, what is this? Like, what, I don't understand it. Um, and I was trying to be as open-minded and like, re just receive it, just hear what they had to say. And I did a little trial and I was like, mm, no, this doesn't resonate for me. And so I'm curious if you were to give any wisdom or advice to others who might look for something that resonates, or maybe the things that you've shared, if there's resonance, how do you trust it? Well, I look for the resonance of anything that comes my way, just because I trust that if, in, if it's in my life, there's some reason for it being there. It doesn't mean I have to stay with that person, place, or situation, yeah. but at least for that moment, there's some reason, and to sense it into that reason, receive that, and then decide whether, okay, this needs to continue or no, I got what mm. I needed, move on. Kind of like what you said oh. about meeting new people. Right. For some reason, this has been brought to you or you've attracted it and just to uncover, discover what that was. And it could be temporary. It could be long lasting. OK. I like the whole idea that, you know, the the non-permanence of it, that, hmm. you know, the things that may come to us, you know, I think sometimes we react out of fear in many cases as opposed to embracing, you know, these the new experience or the new individual or the new circumstance and you know maybe allowing that fear to be lessened or to soften around that fear and allow that person or allow that circumstance to be a part of our lives and just hmm. you know welcome you know that that exchange because there's always an exchange you know there's always the the give and take and or you know, the sharing or the collaboration. And so, you know, and, and to know the well. difference, uh, sorry to interrupt Al, but to know oh, the no. difference between a fear of like me thinking of this tank and it feels like a little scary. And so, but it might be broadening for me. Whereas mm -hmm. what you were talking about, Valerie, is looking at someone and feeling like mm, something, mm -hmm. you know, right. something's not right there. Yeah. Fear can be so informative of you need to get away. Yeah. So to know the difference, to know yourself better are well enough to know the difference between the different types of fear and when to pursue and when, nope, I'm out of here. Have you Good guys time. heard of this Excellent. book, The Gift of Fear? Oh, no, tell me about no. it. No. Oh, highly recommend it. It's by Gavin De Becker. Uh -huh. um, and without giving a whole lot away, essentially he just talks a lot about the work he, he's done. He's more, the, I, don't, I don't know, law enforcement perhaps in that realm. But he does talk about how fear is a gift in that it provides us with information. It is an opportunity for us to listen to our intuition. And he has tons of stories in this book about how people were able to get themselves out of or, or avoid, and sometimes maybe not avoid, but we're now conscious of had they made certain decisions when their intuition mm -hmm. spoke to them, when their fear gave them information, they would have reacted differently, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, yeah, it, it, amen Thanks to so what much. you just said. The, yes, gift, the gift of fear. Um, although it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, right? Like, why would you think the fear is good? Because it feels terrible, generally, <laughs> oftentimes. It, being scared is not one of my favorite sensations or favorite, favorite emotions. And I think what I hear you saying, Anne, is, is to respect it. Mm -hmm. not to run away from it, but to honor it by saying, okay, what is this fear here to show me, to tell me? Am I just exactly. at an edge where I can expand or am I at an edge where I would fall to my death? Yeah. <laughs> like a volcano. <laughs> 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 
Ah, uh, any, um, so a couple of things. One is what has this been, how, how has this experience being on a podcast with a stranger been for, been like for the two of you? Love to hear some of your reflections on this. I've loved it. And I have lots of questions for you still, Al. So <laughs> ah. the relationship can continue. I hope so as well. I, I have absolutely loved it. It has been, you know, so much fun, so informative. And it's, you know, for someone that you have not met before, to see the threads and the, of connection and the things that we hold in common, the things that, you know, are different between us, but being able just to kind of sit down and have that conversation, it would be so wonderful if, you know, just as a society and as a, as a country, as a people, that we would, you know, set aside, you know, what our preconceived notions are and just to sit down and have a conversation. It would be amazing the things that we would be able to find that we hold in common as opposed to things that drive us apart. Mm, 100%. Feels like we've traveled together. We have, this is a trip, <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> what? So if you knowing that we have and you know people who are listening and watching this episode and and perhaps they're resonating with things that you've shared about your journey or about our, our stories or the resources that we've indicated, what what would you like to ask them to do? If you had an invitation for them about anything that we've talked about or experienced today, what's one invitation that the two of you would, would make? Well, I would ask people to sense into their souls no matter who comes into your life, there's a reason and really be looking for that reason. And it's mm. always going to be a lot bigger than what we realize. Mm. Look for that reason. Mm -hmm. ah. Soul nutrition. Soul nutrition. Ah. Write down one thing that gives you joy. Write one thing that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I feel like I'm doing that right now. <laughs> Meeting you guys. Wow. This has been a really joyful conversation. And as I mentioned, I think we could talk for a lot more than what we have today. I do hope the two of you continue the conversation since you have more questions to ask each other. What, what final words do you have for one another or for this experience? And how might people get a hold of you? Well, I'd like to welcome people to the Art of the Heal. It's on Eventbrite. It is a once a month healing journey where a physical therapist friend, Mary Thomas, and I share our tools and healing. It's mm. free of charge. It's online. Or if you live in the Dallas area, it's in person. Check it out. Second Saturday of every month, 9 a.m. Yeah. Central Time. Fascinating. And my what website is anradelps.com. And I'll put that in the show notes so people can just click right into that. Thanks, Ann. I That sounds incredibly exciting. I, I would love to participate in that. So I'm going to be writing that your, your website down as well as uh, earmarking the second Saturday of every month. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I would just like to thank you, Ann, for just sharing who you are, you know, I mean, there's such a combination of kindness and wisdom that is just kind of wrapped up in who you are. And uh, I'm just thankful that I was able to share in that with you today. So, and you as well, Valerie, you know how I think, feel about you. I think you're just the, the, the bomb diggity <laughs> to take something back from the 90s i think you're just wonderful and thank you this is a great this was a really good experience it was for me too i appreciate the two of you for bringing your authentic selves for un helping us uncover because i think this is this is a co-creation by the way there's nothing in the in the preparation of this podcast that i said this is exactly what we're going to talk about and how we're going to talk about it. And you tell the story and you tell that not at all. So I so uh, appreciate it. I'm so encouraged by the co-creation that just took place and the resonant feel that we created with this conversation. And I think, you know, you said this Al about this idea of paying attention in a loving fashion. 
And, and this was an experience where each of us were paying attention in a loving fashion, with an open fashion, a curious fashion to everything that we were sharing and able to then reflect back the impact that had on us. So that was so cool. So, so soul filling, soul nutrition right here. <laughs> I love soul your words. Food. Yeah, soul soul food. food. We had some soul food today. Wow. So for those of you who have tuned into this episode, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you got your own taste of soul food, nutrition, and paying attention in loving ways to this conversation. And now Go out and do the same in your own lives. We've already given you a couple of places where you can look by right? being curious about the people who come to you and then also making sure that you write down something that brings you joy. Thank you so much for joining us. You know how to subscribe and hopefully we'll see you the next time. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Take care. You've been listening to the podcast, Not Quite Strangers. Be sure to subscribe or follow on your favorite video or podcast platform. And for more information and content, go to notquitestrangers.com. See you next time.